Hi, this is Kaisa Carlson, Deputy Ed Editor of Dezine, and I'm broadcasting live from the Dezine studio space in London. Today we're teaming up with Vola for a live talk exploring the importance of design within Danish culture, history and society. And I'm joined by Anne-Louise Sommer, Museum Director of the Design Museum Denmark. Hi Anne-Louise. Hi everyone. I'm also joined by Jane Sandberg, who's the CEO of Enigma Museum of Post, Tele and Communication. Hi, Jane. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to both of you. And I understand that you've both prepared a presentation for us. Um, so if you could please share them with the audience, starting with Anne-Louise. Thank you very much. Does it work? Yes. Yes, all great. Yes, good. Hi, everyone, once again. Uh, here you see uh, the wonderful Design Museum Denmark situated in Copenhagen, located right in the city center. And as you can see, it's an old building. It's from mid uh, 18th century. It's a list of building. And of course, that has something to do with the way we meet people expecting a design museum to be a modern place. It is not, but uh, I will come back to that later. Uh, the museum was established in 1890, so it's been a while. And I've been uh, the director for 10 years now. And uh, these 10 years has been quite a journey. Uh, you can say we have uh, five doubled our number of visitors and we have uh, really uh, try to transform the museum in, uh, in many ways. 80% of the visitors, they are actually international guests. And that's also an interesting uh, aspect of the whole thing because it has to do with the way people uh, look at design here in Denmark and abroad. And uh, you can also say that design in many ways is, uh, will be the DNA of uh, Danish culture. It's really essential in the core uh, this is a, an illustration from our wonderful museum garden, uh, surrounded by the museum. And this is from an event called Design Exchange, which we hold every year in the springtime. And uh, here we focus on design culture at large and how it holds a unique position in Denmark. Of course, it raises the question, what is design in a Danish context, but also in an international perspective? You might know that uh, a lot of people uh, regard uh, Danish design as something quite uh, prominent. And when it comes to the Danes, it's kind of uh, interesting to see that uh, in many ways, it's, I would say it's, it's not invisible, but uh, somehow it's uh, internalized in the Danish culture in such a degree as it's just something as we breathe the air and uh, the focus on the values and uh, things connected to design is not as visible for the Danes as maybe from, for the people from outside. Uh, when we talk about design in Denmark, it's, it's really about, uh, it's about people, it's about connecting people, it's about communities, community building, and it's about society. And I'm going to give you a few examples from the museum and also a few historical examples, which, is, uh, which uh, share some of my perspectives with you. But this nice event is uh, connecting people from a sustainability point of view. This is another photo from the museum, which shows our uh, banquet hall in the museum, which has been converted to a uh, Nordic forest scene. And it's from uh, a yearly event of uh, Night of Culture or Museum Nights, where uh, people can work with design in different ways. And what you see here is a complete immersion. It's a moment of presence. And uh, you see how the handicraft tradition and the craftsmanship is really vital in, uh, in the design field. So here, it's just the visitors enjoying a moment of relaxation and absorption. 
Another aspect which is interesting at the museum is our learning focus and how we work with design in different ways in our design lab, which is a modern building adjacent to the historical building. Here, the school children and the students, they have a hands-on experience with uh, design, which for us is very important. And of course, it's also a dilemma when it comes to uh, the hands-on experience when it's a museum, because museums are really in many ways hands-off because it's museum objects. This is from our uh, last uh, exhibition, Night Fever, just before we closed uh, the museum uh, due to the pandemic and these major restorations we are going on now. And it's an exhibition focusing on clubbing culture and the design take on this uh, night fever thing. It was an exhibition which was about memory lane, common experience, uh, rewived it, things from, from different epochs of uh, the clubbing culture. So it made a focus on how we are shaped by design, emotional and physical. And talking about memory lane, I would like to take you uh, back in time, almost 100 years back in time, where we had the beginning of the heydays of Danish design in the, in the two decades between the two uh, great wars, the 20s and 30s. It was actually here that the democratic tradition was uh, established, and you can say that it was shaped into the 20th century welfare society with the social democratic backbone. As we say in Denmark, with a, a quote from Grundvik, uh, many, many years ago, few have too much and few are too little. And that's quite interesting when it comes to design that we have uh, had periods, times where we had these heavily investments in good design as a governmental project. We had the situation with the architecture design blended together. And first of all, we had the wonderful shaping of public buildings, schools, city halls, libraries, etc. So uh, in many ways, we have this uh, proud legacy and uh, what is of interest for us at Design Museum Denmark is how we can connect between the legacy of the past, the present and the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anne-Louise. That was a really interesting and good introduction, I think, in general, just slightly more to the background uh, of Danish design and why it's still so important today. And uh, moving over to Jane, um, if you could please share your presentation with us and we'll see what you've got to say. I will, and thank you so much for inviting me on this debate. Have a seat. <laughs> <laughs> this, uh, this, is, um, this is my parents' couch. And uh, the reason why I wanted to share this picture with you is that it's a couch that has been designed by one of the uh, fathers of the golden age of Danish design, Bo Monsen. And it's a, it's a couch that for me uh, personally was my first encounter with the good Danish design. Not that I thought a minute of it when I was a child. I was just climbing up in this couch, feeling comfortable, uh, reading books, sitting next to my grandparents or uh, just sitting there on my own. But it, uh, it gave me a sense of quality that I think is very important when you talk about Danish design. And Elise touched upon it in her presentation, but what we have in Denmark is a special focus on, um, on using design as a way of educating not only um, grown-ups but also children. And the focus that we have had for many, many years, many decades in, in Denmark has been to use design and architecture as a way of um, introducing quality and sense of uh, materials uh, to all of us, uh, no matter where we uh, came from in society. Because in the Danish schools, in the Danish homes, in the Danish uh, railway stations, all over, we have, uh, we have had an emphasis on uh, using good design as a way of uh, expressing the state. So this couch, whether I thought uh, about it or not, has been uh, my path to a uh, good design. Today I'm heading a museum that doesn't exist yet because we will open next year, but it's going to be Denmark's Museum of Communication. And before that, I was uh, for uh, seven years heading the Danish Architects Association. I also uh, wrote a book uh, a couple of years ago on how Danes are very good at building communities with each other and maybe trying to 
um, to, to aim at a more equal society also by using uh, design as a way to do that. This is another uh, example of where I personally met uh, good design and architecture uh, from my very early uh, years. This is a picture from uh, the, the Louisiana Museum of Modern Art. Uh, many people go there, of course, to enjoy uh, all the good art. And uh, uh, a lot of people also go there to enjoy the architecture. For me, I remember one of my earliest uh, memories of um, a sense of quality uh, exactly from this place, because I remember a bench uh, that had this special uh, wooden um, uh, seat, and uh, I remember touching it and not knowing, but still feeling that this was really um, a special, uh, a special place to be, and also a special bench to sit on. And that's just another example of how you can almost play the uh, idea of, uh, of quality and, um, and good materials into even a small child's mind. Another example that has meant a lot to me and a lot to, I think, many Danes is, um, is the architect Arne Jacobsen. This is a housing project that he made in 1929. And um, even though it's located in one of the posh areas in the suburbs of Copenhagen, it was still meant as a place for uh, so-called normal people where you could have an apartment. And you, you as you can see, the building is, uh, the, the balconies are placed in a way so that everybody has a view because it's located right next to the sea. And that was a democratic way of, uh, of, of doing uh, housing for people. I grew up very close uh, to this area and I passed it many, many times. And today I'm so lucky that I'm the neighbor to this. And another example uh, of Arne Jacobsen also, which also is, is an iconic building, but also just a gas station for many days uh, is, is the gas station outside of Skås Hoved, also very close to uh, Copenhagen. It looks exactly the same uh, as it does in the picture, even though I can see from the cars that the picture is, uh, is maybe a few <laughs> uh, decades old. But the idea of using good architecture also in a way to push our uh, conceptions of how a gas station should look like uh, is, uh, I think, a very Danish approach. And um, we can see when we pass the gas, the gas station that, that almost every time I pass it, uh, people are photographing it. And I think it's become a viewpoint for many tourists when they visit Copenhagen to go and see this. It's still functioning as uh, a gas station as, and, as well as an ice cream parlor. And then the last uh, example is, is pretty new. It's from the center of Copenhagen. It's uh, a public park called Superkielen a co-op uh, between uh, uh, big architects and uh, the artist group Superflex. And what is so interesting about this is that it might, at least in my opinion, point towards maybe the new way of uh, doing Danish design. It's a park that's located in one of the um, uh, areas in Copenhagen where uh, they used to have quite a lot of uh, problems with the uh, um, with, uh, different uh, things going on between gangs and uh, shootings and so on. But what they did was they tore down, as you can probably see, a whole row of houses and they made a public park. And the interesting approach was that they actually invited the people living close to the park to contribute to how the park should develop, uh, which means that today um, the park is a combination, as you can see, of many different things you can do. Uh, but all the items in the park, you can see a fountain uh, and you can see a sculpture, a playing sculpture, are uh, items that come from other parts of the world. And they come from areas where the inhabitants participating to this project came from originally. So you can see uh, the fountain from Morocco and the play, uh, playing uh, sculpture, I think, is Chinese. And, uh, and you can walk around in the park and you can get like little uh, examples of uh, what uh, urban uh, cityscape looks like in other places of the world where people now living in Copenhagen originally came from. Uh, you can also find soil from Palestine and so on. 
And the park has now become one of the most popular, popular uh, recreational areas in Copenhagen. And obviously, uh, as you can see from the picture, it's, it's a wonderful contrib contrib contribution to an area that used to be a place where most of us avoided to go. So maybe, or hopefully, this will point towards uh, what we can do uh, in the at Danish concept uh, towards uh, maybe having a new wave of uh, a Danish new golden age. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jane. That's really interesting. And uh, obviously a few more places I need to see next time I go to Copenhagen, which that list is already very long. <laughs> so I think what's interesting is that both of you mentioned how Danish design has always been kind of quite integrated in society and it's become something, or not even become something. It seems like it's always been something that's been for ordinary people and not just for people with lots of money. Could you maybe talk a little bit about how this came about. Was it a government intervention at some point? When did Danish design come to the forefront and, and how did it become so integrated into society? And if I should start. <laughs> yeah, <go ahead. laughs> yes, uh, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not that somebody sat down and actually decided for once that this is how we approach it. I think it's, a, it's an ongoing process that went on. But uh, as in many countries in the beginning of the, uh, the 20th century, we had a lot of uh, housing projects. We had a lot, a lot of governmental buildings that needed to be uh, built. And um, at that time, at least, you had another sense of, um, of what it was like to be a public um, uh, builder and the responsibility also to educate people through uh, what you chose, not only the architects, but also of course the uh, uh, materials and the aesthetics was, uh, was much more profound than uh, what, uh, what we see today. So I think it was kind of a tendency, uh, maybe Anne Louise can, uh, can elaborate a little bit on that. Uh, I think you are quite right. It was a tendency. Uh, and if you go to the central part of Europe, for instance, in Germany and uh, Austria, etc., you see wonderful examples of these housing estates from, uh, from the 20s, for instance. But I think there's quite a difference besides of this uh, idea to, in a very uh, ideal way, to uh, create or frame the good life as was the intention for everyone. And that is that um, in Denmark has been a very um, homogeneous country for, for centuries in a way that you really do not see many other places. Maybe, uh, for instance, in, the, in other Nordic countries, because when we say Danish design, we could have said Scandinavian design or Nordic design. Uh, we are quite in line with each other. And... Uh, for instance, one of my neighbors here at the museum, it's actually the Royal Palace. Uh, and if you visit the Royal Palace in Copenhagen, a lot of people are quite surprised because the scale is so different if you compare it to Buckingham Palace or Versailles or something like that. It's more like, a, well, of course you can see it, uh, something which belongs to a nobleman, uh, but it's not like a Royal Palace or a castle. And I think that's quite uh, symptomatic for Denmark that it has this uh, UN uh, kind of, uh, it, it's, it's within a scale that you can understand. And then it's not just a matter of architecture because if you see all these wonderful buildings from the 20s and the 30s, it's also a matter of you have uh, adapted them with the very best of good design. Uh, so that means that uh, even though Jane, she just started with her personal uh, story about uh, growing up in a home with designed furniture. I could have told the same story and uh, maybe we are not like, uh, well, we, we might have been privileged, but uh, no matter what, you can never find someone in Denmark who has not been living surrounded by good design. It might not have been in their homes, but it has been in the schools, the libraries, the, the office of the doctor or whatever. Um, so that's something you have had this kind of internalization of Danish values, design values. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of the, the reason we do not have high design as you do in many other countries. Uh, it's more, you know, middle of the road and uh, it doesn't show off. It's kind of understated, you can, can even say, but uh, it has a lot of... Uh, 
value which is deeply rooted in our in our own culture mm. not just the design culture but the culture at large now that makes a lot of sense and uh, i'm swedish so i grew up with uh, probably fairly similar um, design references to to, Dan to Danish people, um, but I'm curious as well to hear. Oh, I've got a bit of an echo here, I think. <laughs> um, so I'm curious as well to hear about. You were talking a bit about the sort of simplicity of the design. Um, do you both think that this kind of, I mean, I suppose when we think about Danish design, we quite often think of mid-century modern design, quite simple wooden furniture, very clean lines, um, a slightly understated luxury, I suppose. Do you think this kind of simplicity and, and the cleanliness of the design in a way has helped Danish design to stay relevant because it's perhaps not as clearly tied to certain eras as some other international design is? I think it has. And also I think that uh, probably uh, the equality of the Nordic societies, we don't have that many differences. We're also very small countries. So I think also the, the sense of equality uh, means a lot when understanding why uh, things look like they do in the Nordic countries. Looking into also what kind of raw materials we are actually in possession of, <laughs> uh, we don't have that much. But I think the simplicity also has to do with the climate uh, because we are, uh, it's very bright in the summertime and it's very dark many months a year. Uh, and that also, um, I think, uh, plays a role in, in, in how we uh, choose uh, the aesthetics. Uh, it's, it's, it's closely connected to nature. Uh, plastic has never been like a huge thing in, in Danish design. Uh, it's more like uh, natural materials that we, uh, that we tend to use again and again. And of course, you can always raise the questions, do we keep on using these materials because we are so in love with the Danish golden age that we are afraid of uh, leaving it and maybe exploring uh, new areas. But it seems like every time a Danish, uh, a good Danish design comes to life, it is always in connection with the, with the history and also the history of this, uh, the simple approach. Mm. And if I could just add on that one, if you uh, sort of, you can include the whole Nordic design or Scandinavian design, even the Swedish, of course. <laughs> and uh, you can also go further and uh, look at Japan, for instance, because there are very close bonds between uh, the Japanese design and the Danish. And uh, we also have many other similarities uh, country-wise. We have strong uh, tradition for craftsmanship and uh, handicraft we have this connection as jane points to uh, with the the natural materials and we have also when it comes to the landscape the nature etc we have of course have uh, differences but we also have similarities so uh, i think we are deeply rooted in the whole context and you can also mention for instance ph lighting systems which was actually uh, created for almost 100 years ago and it's still uh, considered to be one of the finest uh, lighting solutions when it comes to to design and it's it's not a coincidence that it was in Denmark or it could have been another Nordic country because we have this uh, maybe we have this uh, certain sensibility when it comes to light we are forced to make the most out of it and we uh, need to have these uh, very subtle uh, modulations not just like uh, a flashy light in the ceiling, but um, so so a lot has to do with the geographic and uh, yeah, ge geographic aspects as well. And maybe if I could just chip in here, and maybe also being a historian and looking into you know what what happened before, why did we become the way we did? We did. You have to remember that in 1864, Denmark lost a war to Germany and we lost one third of, of the Danish uh, kingdom. And uh, we also lost the illusion of ever becoming a great nation in, Europe, in, in European context. And I think that reaction uh, or the, uh, what happened afterwards was also uh, um, maybe a frame to understand why uh, the simplicity is, is so important. Human proportions turning towards uh, uh, communities, people uh, finding each other in uh, in projects, uh, 
because they had realized that they couldn't do anything on their own. We couldn't become great if we didn't uh, find each other. And, uh, and also a sense of modesty that maybe expresses uh, itself through the simplistic approach in, in the Danish tr design tradition also is somehow rooted in that defeat in 64. That's a really interesting aspect that I've actually never heard discussed before in sort of a Danish design context. So this idea that the country is almost looking inwards and seeing how you could make things better within the country rather than trying to become some sort of um, Scandinavian superpower, I suppose. <laughs> and would you say today, uh, a lot of the time, obviously, we've, we've done the same thing here. When you talk about Danish design, you talk about this earlier golden age, this mid-century time. But what is it like today? Do you think that Danish design is still um, is still a big part of Danish society? And when Danish schools are being built today, for example, is it still the same idea that you should have beautiful, uh, easily usable design in public buildings? Um, I think uh, in some ways it's still a part of it. Uh, in other ways, it's not prioritized in the degree it should be. And uh, that's actually a pity. And that's why it's so interesting to go back to the 20s and the 30s, because at that time, I mean, we, it was a rather poor country, really. And uh, despite of that, there were these heavy investments. So that's just to say that uh, it's always a matter of prioritizing whether you do something or not. You can promote or you can do the opposite. So I think, uh, seen from a politi political point of view, I think it would be very nice if they had a stronger priority of uh, design also when it comes to the public buildings. When that's said, I, I think there's uh, a, a strong, still vivid uh, element in Danish design. Maybe there has been one or two decades from the end of the 20th century until uh, way into the 21st, where design was not that uh, kind of uh, future oriented. And uh, I remember there was an exhibition in New York City in the 2000 or something like that. And it was actually called Danish Design is an Old Chair. Or at least that was one of the catalog uh, texts framing this exhibition. And that was the whole challenge young designers had that no one wanted to see their designs. They just wanted to have all the classics, the icons, and I think we have uh, sort of moved a bit ahead of that uh, position. And today, a lot of things is actually happening within design and still in line with tradition. And that's the interesting part, because uh, when you talk about tradition, at least in my respect, it has to do with a vivid tradition. It has to do with how can you rewipe the things from uh, bygone ages and uh, frame it within the contemporary and even future oriented context. So I think we can, uh, well, I'm not going to predict anything, but I think we can look uh, ahead of uh, maybe a new golden age uh, for Danish design. And that has to do with the take on uh, user-driven innovation, sustainability, the idea of design being something which can frame a society. We also talk about uh, Denmark as a design society which is quite important because we are not a design nation, something built just to be Danish or Denmark, but we have a kind of uh, uh, take on design and an approach which uh, hopefully could inspire other people from different parts of the world because uh, design can make a difference also for society if it's value-based. Jane, would you agree with that? Yeah. Uh, yes, I would. Uh, but I would also like to just go a little bit back to the question you raised before, Kaiser, because you asked about the politicians. Do they still prioritize uh, uh, building uh, in a way that, that enhances uh, uh, quality and so on? I think a lot of politicians suffer from the notion that quality is more expensive than cheaper uh, buildings. That is not true, uh, obviously. If, if you look into um, uh, or you do the math <laughs> and see uh, what can actually uh, pay off, uh, usually uh, quality pays off in the long run. Uh, politicians work within a short time frame because they have to be re-elected whenever there is an election. And that's in Denmark, uh, a four year period, if we're lucky. <laughs> and uh, that means that um, the uh, clever decisions are not always made because um, because it 
it comes down to uh, a matter of um, of uh, the spending cost uh, and not uh, in a long perspective, which I think is such a shame. When you look at some of the uh, governmental buildings that are now 120, 140, 150 years old, we still have them. <laughs> we, we can still use them. Of course, they have to be remodeled once in a while, uh, but, but they are still there and they are still strong examples of a state that uh, uh, had a strong priority on 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 and and the responsibility for educating the people, and uh, I think that's one of the things that we can. If we have to be worried, I think that's one of the worry points that we should focus on. Because um, as uh, as inhabitants in a country where design and good architecture has been such an important uh, um, thing, I think we need to demand it from our politicians that we keep on prioritizing. Um, uh, the uh, the Danes meetings with uh, with a good quality, uh, but I also know that that's almost a loser case. <laughs> if I talk to politicians, it's it's very hard to to raise that argument and be heard. But uh, I'll still do the uh, I'll, I'll still try. Uh, yeah, it, it's it's an important issue, and uh, I I do agree. And I actually have a very uh, interesting personal example because when we talk about this uh, investment point or whatever we could call it, I will say that sustainability it has a lot of dimensions in the idea of sustainability, and one of them is durability, and that's very important when it comes to uh, the good Danish classic design you can have the furniture classics that they are still going on and on and on and for instance I have at my office here at the museum I have the meeting table and the writing desk and furniture from the first social democratic prime minister in Denmark who was elected in the late 20s and in 1930 he commissioned I'll just show you a photo here whoops he commissioned a really high-end uh, um, set of furniture from Corklint here, who is the father of, uh, of Danish design, furniture design. And it was extremely expensive. And uh, it would never have happened today because people would say, or the politicians or the uh, public uh, swear would say that it's, it's uh, impossible to uh, invest so many money in uh, a single design. But now... 90 years after, I still use the furniture. So it's uh, sustainability on so many levels, you can say. Mm -hmm. So that was just a, a, a personal story. But that's obviously so true. It's, uh, it makes sense to have well-made design that you can then keep for, in this case, over 100 years, I suppose. But in terms of sustainability um, as well, we do often quite, we quite often talk about Denmark as being one of the countries on the forefront of sustainable design not just in terms of design that lasts for a long time, but also the sourcing of the material, um, using transport that's not as bad for the environment as, as other means, such as, um, I suppose, using trains rather than planes to transport furniture. How important is that to Danish design today that the actual parts of the, the furniture and the entire production process is sustainable? As in all other fields of society, of course, there is a, a, an awareness that grows and grows. Uh, I, I think, uh, especially within the design field, uh, there is a, a very strong um, um, urge to uh, meet uh, the demands of the climate. <laughs> and, uh, and of course, also, when you look at it from uh, uh, the perspective of the buyers of the design, uh, things will change. and uh, and. I'm sure that you, you, you could almost not find a designer or a, a, a factory producing, mass producing design that does not have the focus on sustainability. And I think also the uh, transparency uh, that we have in, in, in our countries, in the Nordic countries, means that we as consumers uh, are also, um, it's very easy for us to check uh, the uh, supply chain and see if it's something that we can actually live with. Uh, also morally, morally uh, it has this been produced in a way that we can um, uh, uh, legitimize uh, to, towards ourselves that we buy uh, a piece of design. Uh, usually when you buy a couch or a chair uh, and it's a design product, it's expensive. And uh, of course, uh, when you make a decision to buy a chair for, for a lot of money, 
or a couch. Um, of course, uh, I think we more and more will look into uh, consumers checking out the background, <laughs> uh, checking out how has it been produced? Uh, is, it, uh, is it something that uh, I want to have in my home? Not only as um, uh, um, a, an identity mark, but also, uh, you know, can you live with it yourself? I think it would be quite ideal, Jane, if it was that way. I'm not sure it is always uh, because uh, I guess Danes are like most are, some are very uh, aware of these things and do have this uh, kind of uh, political consumer, correct consumer approach to design and a lot of people, they do not have it. So it's, I guess it's like uh, many other places in the world. When it comes to transportation, as you just uh, mentioned before, I think it, 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 there might be something there. And then I have to say that if you do not know Denmark, I can tell you it's one of the tiniest countries in the world, which means that we do not need to go by uh, domestic flights to go from one part to another. But still, we do a lot of, uh, I mean, we are as, <laughs> uh, as uh, we need aviation as much as anyone when we go to the world, etc. What is unique for Denmark is our bicycle culture, not just for Denmark, there are also other places like the Nordic countries and uh, the Netherlands, for instance. And that's a unique thing that you have this kind of uh, easygoing transportation connected to uh, 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 very environmental friendly uh, thing as the bi bicycle you can say and uh, in many ways it's also embedded in our culture and I have experienced a lot of times when I travel abroad or other places the first thing people they, they ask is oh do you also go by bicycle to at work and uh, because it's kind of a uh, Part of the impression of Danes, they always are happy on a bicycle, uh, no matter if they're going to a party at the at the Queen's uh, Palace or going to work or other leisure activities. So I think there might be something there which is uh, unique, but it's also it has to do with the the, the size of the country, and uh, I mean you can't compare it to the States or to China, Russia, whatever. But I think I'm, I'm, I totally agree with you, Annalisa, that a lot of people, you know, one thing is what you say and another thing is what you do. But I, it, looking into tendencies and, uh, and also to maybe a little bit ahead of us, if you look into what happens within the younger generations, I'm sure that the demand for uh, producers and designers that are transparent, that can actually document that they do it the proper way, will increase uh, immensely. Our generation, you and I, uh, uh, we are almost the same age. Um, we would, uh, I mean, we, we represent another approach, another consumer approach, but looking into how young, younger generations act and also um, uh, what, they, uh, what they say uh, no to is, is, is different. And I think the demand for a, a much more sustainable approach to, to, to design uh, will definitely be something that will uh, just keep on uh, racing in the, in the years to come. I completely agree, but I do not think it's uh, only Danes. I think it's a general tendency. So it's kind of a global thing. And I will say it's more a matter of uh, the level of education, uh, whether you will be able to have these kind of uh, uh, thoughts about uh, the impact of, uh, on the, yeah, the, the, the general footprint, etc. cetera. Uh, so, if it goes with the level of education, you can say that in Denmark, we are quite well educated as, uh, of course, other countries, but they're not, I guess, in the high end of, you know, on a global scale. And we even in the, in the public school, we even have, uh, the, the small children have a, a course that is called design. So they have to meet design during their school years. Yeah. That's really interesting. So and that's yeah. something completely new. Uh, it started uh, and it's only on a few, um, a few grades they have it. And, uh, but it's, it's a beginning and it should be really uh, <laughs> carried out for large scale, I think. But if we think about Danish design as something that's come, that's grown through uh, a fairly equal society with like a high standard of living, uh, which has also for quite a long time had a focus on sustainability, I suppose partly because a lot of the furniture was made from wood, which you can 
easily is the wrong word, but you can trace the origins of it. Um, but how does that place Denmark on the international scene? What can Danish design offer an international audience if it's a design movement that's quite closely tied to um, the country that it was shaped in? I think it's uh, it's possible to act as a, well, I, I don't know if a role model is the right word, but uh, maybe an inspirational force because you can regard Denmark as this rather tiny, homogeneous, uh, equal uh, country, that it could be like a, you know, like a laboratory or something like that, where you could actually uh, visit and see how uh, different initiatives uh, uh, result in uh, practices which might be, uh, be good. That's one thing. The other thing I would like to say something about is actually going back to uh, Jane's presentation where you showed the super keen, the, the urban uh, space you saw where it was sort of uh, different places in the world uh, um, presented in one, that it has a lot to do with the, the Danish design tradition, this, because you can say it was a kind of an eclectic approach or trying to uh, unite different global uh, aspects and if you look at the Danish uh, furniture tradition it's actually uh, something which has been to an extreme extent inspired by other cultures furniture you can mention the shaker furniture from the states or you can mention oh. the Ming chair from China and the even the Swedish uh, peasant furniture etc etc and I think that's part of the explanation why Danish design gained such fame because everyone could sort of recognize things from their own culture in the expression, in the shape, but still in a way that it was, um, you can say, uh, blended through this uh, rather refined, simplistic uh, uh, DNA, which could be connected to Danish design. And I'm so glad you touched upon Super Keen again, Anne Louise, because it's really one of my favorite uh, projects in the city. And uh, I think one thing that I would like to point out from this project is the collaboration between the designers, the architects, and the inhabitants. Looking at uh, the inhabitants as resources contributing to the design process is probably uh, one thing that you uh, we, we, we can't brag of much, but I think this is actually a thing we can be a little bit proud of in, the, in Danish context because we're quite good at that. We're quite good, especially when it comes to public spaces and in cities. Uh, we have had a lot of projects going on the past 10 years uh, where, um, and a lot of successful products, uh, projects where uh, inhabitants have been working together with the professional designers uh, in order to fulfill a need uh, and make a, a space uh, where uh, we can meet uh, no matter who we are and where we come from in society. And because it's a public space, um, it's also a way of emphasizing that we, are, uh, we have a democratic approach towards our shared common spaces. Uh, and that would be my uh, hope that, uh, that uh, we, we continue to uh, go down that path in, in Denmark and maybe in a way uh, that uh, also inspires other countries to come and look at this. Mm. And That's I, really interesting. I, I, I completely agree on that one. And you can even also say it has to do with design as processes. Now we have been talking about design as objects, a different scale, whether it has been uh, the lighting system or the building or the urban space, but uh, design has also to do with the processes and how you reach a certain uh, goal together. And I think it's, it's unique, uh, this kind of um, insisting on design should be uh, accessible for everyone. Everyone has a vote. We should always look at the, the, um, the ones not necessarily uh, on top of society. Uh, what about children? Which kind of needs do they have? Elderly people, etc. It's sort of a good uh, uh, blend of uh, of uh, everyone being part of a process uh, when it should be successful. So uh, there's also something we might inspire other to um, to follow. Hmm. 
And obviously, um, for this talk, we've teamed up with Vola, which was founded in 1968, I believe, and uh, Anna Jacobsen designed for the brand. And it's one of the uh, big Danish design brands that's still a large popular brand today. But we're also seeing a number of smaller Danish design brands are becoming more and more well known to, to a wider global audience. So do you feel that we are perhaps in a second kind of golden age of Danish design where we're seeing not just the brands that kind of are still with us from the first golden age and have refined their products, but also emerging designers who are taking up that kind of mantle and perhaps making products that are slightly different or perhaps veering off a little bit more from what we normally think of as, as Danish design? Oh, yes. Sorry, Jane. Go ahead, Alice. No, I would just say that uh, I definitely feel that we have this kind of uh, second golden age uh, due to some of the big issues of the time. Uh, and I also think we witness these years a different take from the established design uh, companies, uh, the ones with the, the legacy and the... <laughs> In the, and the heritage production that they are quite eager to find out and to team up with new designers, sort of to uh, give a, a, a yeah new life to uh, to an old brand. So eventually, maybe these two golden ages are also merging in many ways, uh, which is also nice because I think there's a space for for everyone, and we still definitely also need the classics. But a lot of interesting things are happening these years and uh, also due to these uh, political correct consumers and their demands, there will definitely be, be um, it will be necessary to also broaden the perspective up and, uh, and uh, be open to new products and new uh, approaches to design. One thing that I've noticed is um from other parts of society, uh, there's become an increased interest in the, in the design thinking process, uh, in, the, in the, how we uh, work uh, within the design field. Uh, could we maybe uh, applicate that approach towards other fields? And um, I think that would be interesting as well, because then design is not just seen as products, but also as processes and uh, maybe also as methods for developing new ideas. And that I think would be very, very interesting if uh, this may be a tendency towards a more uh, broad-minded view on design, if we could also add that into the second wave of the uh, Danish uh, golden age. That ties in with, uh, we've got a good audience questions from uh, Malka, who's wondering, do younger Danish designers feel inhibited from exploring non-Danish design? So if you're a young designer in Denmark today, do you think people feel this pressure to do what is traditionally seen as, as good Danish design, I suppose? That's not what I see when I look at new designers' products. Uh, but of course, they have the history. I mean, we're standing on, on the shoulders of history. Def and, and I don't think you can be a designer in Denmark not being familiar with the design tradition. And I also think if you look into the curriculum at the design uh, 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 universities, and as you know more about this, but my notion would just be that, that of course you're very aware of, of the legacy of Danish design. But when I look into the products of the new designers, I don't, see, I don't look at, it, uh, at the history as, uh, as a limitation, but more as a possibility. Yeah, an extra source where you can uh, add from. That was also what I talked about with the example of the uh, old chair <laughs> metaphor for design uh, before. I think it has uh, changed a lot uh, during the past two decades and there's much more open approach, much more uh, opportunities for the young designers. As you just said, Jane, I have a background at the, um, the Design University, the Royal Academy, where I've been uh, uh, rector before I came to the museum and I had a lot of opportunities to follow the young designers and their processes. Afterwards, I was uh, a member of their board of directors uh, for many years. So I really have followed it quite closely. And of course, I still do it in my present position. So I think there's a lot of things happening and there's a lot of opportunities uh, and I also feel when I talk to people, I mean, they're quite more open to maybe uh, invest in good design from young designers than 
just to buy the usual suspects, you can say the icons, as was the case for 10, 20 years ago. So uh, let's uh, cross our fingers and hope for a new, uh, new era for design. So that's really interesting. So you think there's, there's more sort of fertile ground in Denmark for younger designers now than perhaps, say, 10 or 20 years ago, because people then might have been still more interested in the classics. Yes, I think so. And also uh, it has to do with the general transformation of uh, the design field. Instead of just being object based, it's much more diverse now as one thing. And then also the the, the great uh, global agendas we have these years in many ways. I mean, sustainability, climate crisis, etc., And also a social uh, responsibility in many ways. It taps very fine into the, the more classic discussion of design, Danish design, and it opens new opportunities, I think. And also the increased uh, knowledge of what design processes can contribute with. Uh, and I think that will definitely mean uh, that um, also the, 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 the position that design has in, in the minds of, of the, the people in Denmark has, has, has altered. And, uh, and, and now it's not just you know, consumer products, it's also a, a, a working process where uh, sustainability means a lot, where you can actually, um, when, if you work with the design thinking method, you can actually uh, uh, develop new ideas and become much more creative. Uh, and I think the, um, uh, the demand for creativity and innovation has uh, altered quite a bit during the past uh, two decades. And now we know, uh, again, maybe realizing that we are such a small country that if we should ever be able to contribute with anything, it might be exactly that. <laughs> That's really interesting and uh, a good point. I've got another audience question from Callum, and he's wondering, do you think the focus on human well-being is the most important and or influential factor in Danish design? I think that uh, if I should, if if somebody asks me what is like the key word for Danish design, it's is the human approach. So I think definitely uh, that uh, that means a lot to the designers and also to the consumers. Uh, whenever um, uh, when I worked in the architectural business, um, whenever I had visitors, especially from uh, the states. They were always amazed by the fact that our cities and our approach to de to design um, always had a human scale, and I think that's embedded in 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 the Danish way of doing design, thinking design, acting design. Exactly, and then you can of course discuss what well-being means, uh, as the question said, because well-being can be many things. It could be something which connects to what I mentioned before as high design, this, this kind of uh, luxurious uh, thing. It's not part of the Danish tradition, but well-being in a, you can even say humanistic approach or a respect for the single uh, individual is very essential. And that has a lot to do with the well-being for me at least, but it's, uh, you know, more, um, yeah, middle of the road well-being in rather than extravaganza. But that also ties in with what Jane was talking about uh, with the square, where the people who lived close to the square got to be involved in the design process and sort of, um, <clears throat> sorry, create not just the kind of physical infrastructure where they live, but I suppose also the social infrastructure. And do you think that's something that's typical for Danish design and architecture today, that there's more of a dialogue between the people who are using the final product? Definitely. Yes. Yeah, it's very dialogue based. I mean, that's really uh, essential. And when, uh, I mean, may maybe 20 years ago, the, the, the notion of a human uh, as use, uh, user driven uh, design was really a buzzword. And uh, in many ways, I was kind of, well, yes, of course, that's important. But it has always been like that in Denmark, in many ways that it was user driven, because you never just created things which were not user-driven, then of course you can discuss 
who are the end users, but uh, there is this broad, very uh, um, including perspective. Inclusion is another word which is connected to, to Danish design, uh, accessible, uh, including, and um, yeah. We That's also, as, as consumers, uh, I'm sorry, Louisa, but you just got me started. <laughs> I think as, as consumers, we also uh, are being well-trained by uh, the social media because everybody can contribute today and we, we have an expectation of being involved. And that, I think, is not Danish. That, that goes on all over the world. But we are much more used to um, uh, expressing ourselves and also uh, expecting that uh, our voices, when we raise them, are actually being heard. Mm. That's true. And that it's, it goes for the world at this moment. But you can go way back even to uh, our own childhood, <laughs> which is some years ago where the Danish school system was very different from other countries. I mean, when I say our, I include the other Nordic countries as well. But the idea of uh, uh, even a child has a voice which should be heard. And we were trained in kind of more critical approaches. It was okay to say something which the professor didn't say or question things or even provoke uh, uh, more fixed uh, opinions. And that has to do with a special tradition, which has maybe gone worldwide now, but uh, is also part of our DNA. Mm. I've got a, a sort of follow-up question to that from, uh, from a viewer, it's called The Buffalo Estate, who's wondering, do you think that the city density of Denmark contributed to the human approach to design? Uh, I suppose in terms of city density, I'm not quite sure if Gen Denmark geographically is a small country, um, but I don't know, would you say that a lot of people live in cities or close to cities and that this influenced design? They live close, yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's a very urban country, you can say. When we talk about nature, as we did before with the design DNA, it's really nature as such. It's a, the cultural landscape. Everything is cultivated. But what is interesting about this uh, question is also the idea of, you can say, we live in livable cities and Copenhagen is really a livable city. And I think that's why there has been a lot of attention from a lot international audience to Copenhagen as a urban uh, experiment because uh, 20, 30, 40 years ago, it was not praised Copenhagen. It was kind of, uh, well, of course, there was a wonderful historical call but then a lot of things happened, which was not, I mean, urban wise, which was not that good. Today, you can even swim in the harbor. You can enjoy numerous uh, urban spaces as the super keen. And you can mention a lot other places. So it has really been the idea of uh, you sort of pop into a residential area, which is also a touristic scene, which is also a place where people work. It's sort of melted together in a good way. And you, you, before, and Lucy, you talked about being a bicycle country. Uh, and obviously, if you're a bicycle country, it's because the, the distances are not that hard. And uh, obviously, we don't have any mountains, so it's quite easy to bike here. But I think the, um, it's, not, it's, it's important to stress that it's not only in, in the large cities that you will see this livability. You will actually see it when you move around in Copenhagen. Uh, a lot has happened to the cities within the last 20 years especially in the public spaces. Uh, in 20 years ago, you wouldn't be able to find an outdoor space where you can hang out uh, in the evening uh, if it was not a cafe. Now it's all over. Uh, every square uh, is, has been transformed into something that can be used by everybody. And, uh, and a lot of um, also, um, a, a lot of, um, there's been a, a much more uh, a keen interest in how we use public spaces to keep uh, making this, uh, uh, this the, the country livable for all things. And what, what brought about this change? You said it was sort of 20 years ago, so when you started thinking about this idea of the city as a more livable space. Maybe, maybe uh, it's not even 20 years ago, maybe it has to do with the financial crisis because uh, a lot of the architects that were very busy until uh, uh, the financial crisis of course, of course had to turn inwards, reinvent, uh, what they were doing, and that goes for designers as well as, as, as architects. And maybe if you look into it, uh, I should rephrase and say 2007. <laughs>
but but still there might be a, a change in interest but you still need some investors or some politicians who promote this new thing so uh, it's a, it's a combined or joint force you can say that it has happened and of course it has also been part of the municipality of Copenhagen, if we take that example, that they wanted to have some taxpayers which were actually uh, able to pay tax because suddenly Copenhagen has become a very rich city. It was not, it wasn't that for 20, 30 years ago, but now it's, uh, it's really, you know, like uh, being in, in some sort of urban uh, heaven, you can say, uh, and, uh, and people want to live here. So it has been a complete uh, a turnaround uh, uh, urban-wise. So there's a lot of factors, I think, that, uh, that, that uh, support this uh, development. Well, that's a, that's a good advertisement for making livable cities that you'll get loads of people who wants to come and live there and you get new taxpayers. I'm sure plenty of mayors would be happy to have that in their cities and towns. Um, before we go, I was hoping that both of you could just say a little bit about your museums uh, when they're reopening and what people will be able to come and see when they're open next, if we start with Anne-Louise. Yes, I would love to do that. When, uh, when you come to uh, Copenhagen in, uh, for instance, June next year, and the Design Museum has uh, reopened, you will see a wonderfully transformed list of building, uh, wonderful architecture and completely new exhibitions all over the museum. So it has been quite a journey for us and we really hope to, to open up with something which, uh, which will, uh, yeah, what can we say, uh, excite you, uh, full of um, curiosity in many ways. We have like three legs in our exhibition. One is we are looking back. We are looking back at the heritage and our very rich historical collection. We are very present here in our uh, uh, contemporary now and uh, with the, the backbone of the design legacy in the 20th century. And we are future oriented. We are looking uh, ahead and uh, try to address uh, what will design be in the future. Because uh, when we talk about future, it's interesting that we are not, you know, like, uh, well, what can we predict? What is going to happening? No, we are actually shaping the future through design this very moment. So what we see as prototyping these years among the young designers, that might be the next classic, the next icon, or at least shaping our future. So that's why design is so important and why it, it, it's so value-based in the end. So hope to see all of you. <laughs> that's great. Thank you so much, anne -Louise. And if I can move on to Jane, if you can tell us a bit about the Enigma Museum. Yes, thank you for asking. <laughs> uh, we will open with uh, a completely new take on, uh, on the communication. And uh, we will, as uh, which is a little uh, contradiction to, to being a, a museum, we will take our starting point in the present times, and we will uh, we will open with four different exhibitions, uh, all dealing with fake news, with surveillance, and with the uh, digital education. Uh, especially, um, I think it, it would be interesting to visit the museum if you come and come in the company of children. Because uh, one of the things that we have learned during the past five years when we've transformed the museum and altered the scope has been that a lot of young parents are very uh, insecure on how to make borders when uh, their children travel out in the digital world. And, uh, and we will try to uh, not only uh, educate the children, but also their parents. And we will try to do it in a fun way so uh, they can play their way through um, their own family rules on how to have a digital life. And of course, for all of us, uh, it will be interesting also to look, in, look into uh, what happens when a society is under pressure and a democracy is under pressure, especially when it comes to uh, fake news and alternative facts. And when you come to and visit Enigma, you will uh, leave the museum with uh, skills so you will know a little bit about, uh, more about uh, what to do to check out the facts and uh, be sure to be a critical user of the, the, all the different media that uh, we are met by every day. That's great. Well, I very much hope to come and bo visit both museums next summer. And uh, thank you so much for taking part in this talk. I think it's been really interesting and we had some great questions from the audience this time. 
And so, yeah, thank you very much. And I hope to see you in Copenhagen very soon. You shall be welcome. Thank you so much for inviting. Looking forward to seeing you. Bye. Bye.